Year 10 and 11, welcome to your video analysing Friar Lawrence in preparation for your English Literature AQA exam. On the slide they have spelt Friar Lawrence with a W. I do realise that sometimes it is also spelt with a U. Okay, so this is an, an analysis of Friar Lawrence. Very basically, Friar Lawrence helps Romeo and Juliet throughout the play. He performs their marriage and gives generally good advice, especially in regard to the need for moderation. He is the sole figure of religion in the play. But Friar Lawrence is also the most scheming character. He marries Romeo and Juliet as part of a plan to end the civil strife in Verona. He helps Romeo into Juliet's room and then out of Verona. He devises the plan to reunite Romeo and Juliet through the sleeping potion idea. In addition, Friar Lawrence's plans all seem well-conceived and well-intentioned. They serve as the main mechanisms through which the fated tragedy of the play occurs. In many ways, he brings the tragedy. When I say that, I mean he's a catalyst, isn't he? Romeo and Juliet were always going to die because we are told that in the prologue that fate is working against them, star-crossed lovers. But Friar Lawrence almost assists fate by speeding up events. If we add a little bit more detail here, Friar Lawrence is presented as a holy man who is trusted and respected by the other characters. The friar's role as the friend and advisor to Romeo and Juliet serves to highlight the conflict between parents and their children within the play. Because remember, they can't go to their parents for advice, so they use the friar. Therefore, his role also suggests that there is a failure of parental love and guidance here. In their isolation, both Romeo and Juliet turn to him for advice. At first, the friar can't believe how quickly Romeo has abandoned Rosaline and fallen in love with Juliet, so he reminds Romeo of the suddenness of his decisions. I shall mention that later. The friar uses formal language of rhyme and proverbs to, to stress the need for caution to Romeo when he's telling them that you don't need to be so hasty. You don't need to marry her immediately. He agrees, though, to marry Romeo and Juliet, which I suppose is ironic because he tells Romeo not to rush, but then agrees to help him marry Juliet. But he has a reason for this. He agrees to marry the pair because he thinks it will repair the rift between the Montagues and Capulets. His decision to marry them is well-meaning, but it indicates that the friar is naive. And he's naive to think that this marriage will end the feud. And his short-sightedness here is one of his flaws. Again, I shall mention that in more detail later. The friar's knowledge of the plants, especially their dual qualities to heal and hurt, play an important role in the action of the play. When Juliet is about to take the potion, she questions the friar. She questions whether or not the potion will actually kill her, so no one knows what he has done. But she puts aside this worry, agreeing that the friar is a holy man. And there's your quotation. I don't expect you to remember this entire quotation in an unseen exam. We just need to shorten it. The quotation reads... What if it be poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest I'm in this marriage he should be dishonoured, because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is, and yet methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. So if we remember in a short quotation there, we would probably remember the end. He hath still been tried a holy man. And that reassures Juliet that his actions are sincere. And Juliet uses the same words as the prince here because at the end of the play, the prince um, says something about the friar being holy. So in the last scene, he reasserts the type of man the friar is, i.e. this religious holy man who I suppose the characters have trusted, especially Romeo and Juliet. 
if we just go through his key scenes in more detail. Remember to feel free to stop the video where you need to make notes. I have a habit of starting to talk quickly. So, Act 2, Scene 3. The Fry is anxious to end the feud between the Montagues and the Capulets. It is even more tragic that the deaths of the lovers brings about the reconciliation that the friar thinks the marriage will achieve. So he thinks he's going to marry Romeo and Juliet and the families will become friends. But actually, it's the deaths that forces the families to re reconcile. The friar's long opening soliloquy, make sure you get that spelled correctly, establishes him as a kindly and good-natured man who is skilled in the art of poison and medicines. The friar has a vision of the world as good and evil and this links to the main themes of love and hate. In Friar Lawrence's cell, he is holding a basket and foreshadowing is a huge device here. He explains that some plants are medicinal. Quotation, many for many virtues excellent. And Romeo enters the scene just as the friar explains that some plants are harmful. Now, that is structure by Shakespeare, isn't it? So that the very instant we hear about poison, the way Romeo kills himself, Romeo enters the scene. So that is Shakespeare being very clever with his structure there and actually warning us. And when the friar explains that the plants are harmful, he says, being tasted, steer slays all senses with the heart and this foreshadows the death of Romeo which I just mentioned it makes the events easier to understand for the audience but this foreshadowing reminds us of fate events have already been predetermined and once again Shakespeare reminds us of the prologue in act two scene three then we are introduced to Friar Lawrence and how he considers good and evil existing in all things. So speaking of medicinal plants, the Friar claims that though everything in nature has a useful purpose, it can also lead to misfortune if used improperly. Again, massive quotation. I don't expect you to remember it all, but here it is. For naught so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. No art so good but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice being misapplied, and vice sometimes by action dignified. So again, the easiest section to remember there is virtue itself turns vice. Okay, now at the end of this passage, the friar's rumination turns toward a broader application. He speaks of how good may be perverted to evil and evil may be purified by good. He suggests that the deeper flawed human being imposes some degree of mutability on the entire process. Good and evil coexist in imperfect harmony. And again, I've just reiterated, reiterated that quote there. And again, this contrast of, of the plant that it can be medicinal or poison serves to link to the theme of conflict that runs throughout the play. Conflict between the families. Love versus hate. Light versus darkness. Youth versus old age. Okay. The friar tries to put his theories to use when he agrees to marry Romeo and Juliet because he hopes the love will end the feud. Again, look, it's love and hate intertwined. Unfortunately, the friar causes the very opposite. The plan involving the sleep-inducing potion, which he in intends to preserve Romeo and Juliet's marriage and love, results in both of their deaths. Remember the friar is almost working against fate and then, ironically, helps fate. He speeds up the deaths of the lovers. More obviously in this scene, the friar cannot believe that Romeo isn't talking about Rosaline. 
He even says when Romeo comes in that Romeo hasn't been to bed. Where has he been? Has he been with Rosaline? So there's your quote. Was that with Rosaline? So clearly the friar knows Romeo quite well because he knows that Romeo pursues and lusts after Rosaline. And he questions him. Is Rosaline whom thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? That quote is huge. It points out Romeo's flaw. What, you forgot about Rosaline already? And you've fallen in love with somebody else? Is essentially what he's saying. It shows us the flaw of Romeo, that he falls in love too easily. The friar even explains that Rosaline knew Romeo's feelings were insincere. Again, a sort of hint on at Romeo's character. And he says, oh, she knew well thy love did read by rote that could not spell. So, as I say, he cannot believe that Romeo has fallen in love with someone else. He can't believe that his feelings for Rosaline are gone. He is kind-hearted to Romeo and Juliet and he appears wise and selfless. But he is an unknowing servant of fate, as I mentioned before. All of his plans go awry and create the misunderstandings that lead to the tragedy. But it is Friar Lawrence who reminds us of Rosalind. The friar cannot believe Romeo's love could turn so quickly from one person to another. And he says, young men's love then lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. So again, it's almost a mockery of Romeo that he's fallen in love at first sight. The friar acts almost as the voice of reason in this scene. And Romeo actually says, you're always mocking me for how I felt for Rosaline. Thou child, thy child, sorry, thou chides me off for loving Rosaline. The friar says he would tell Romeo off for obsessing, not for loving. So the friar's response to that is, I'm not mocking you because you're in love. I am mocking you because you're obsessed. So as I said, he seems to know Romeo very well here. And he points out, like there's a subtle undertone that the friar is cautioning Romeo about diving in and acting really quickly upon on emotion, i.e. a loving Juliet. Just to add on some extra information. So the friar is a religious idealist. We know he collects herbs and he mentions that they display conflicting characteristics. We've discussed that. He is holy. He is anxious to help the lovers in order to, you know, to end the feud. His decision to marry Romeo and Juliet in secret and deceive the Capulet family with the sleeping potion actually serves to emphasise his naivety. So make sure you get, you get that, that he is naive in his attempts, isn't he? Regarding the feud. Uh, Romeo's relationship with the friar highlights the theme of youth versus age. I mentioned that. He acts as a father figure to Romeo. He is the only person they can both confide in. He is the only person other than the nurse that knows that Romeo and Julie get, mar Romeo and Julie get married. Now, Romeo is typically impulsive and wants to be married that very day. Whereas the friar using formal language and rhyme advises caution, reminding Romeo of the love he's recently had for Rosaline and the speed with which he has abandoned that love. I'm just going to put the quotation on the next slide. So the huge quotation at the top is the reason he marries them. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be. Huge quotation, I'll thy assistant be, because it supports everything I've said about him, assistant fate, acting as the catalyst, assisting the deaths. Now, for this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancor to pure love. For this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancor to pure love. That is him giving his reason for marrying Romeo and Juliet. 
Unfortunately, those very words begin a long chain of events which act as the catalyst, speeding up the play's inevitable end. Now, your massive quotation where he warns Romeo not to act out of haste is wisely and slow. They stumble that run fast. So remember that. They stumble that run fast. Obviously, stumble here means it's going to be a problem if you keep acting so quickly. And he's right. And that foreshadows all of the problems that Romeo is about to encounter. Shakespeare also uses the friar as a means of challenging fate and light and darkness. Through his language, when we first meet him, we see many contrasts. He makes statements such as, Eastern clouds with streaks of light and fleck darkness like a drunkard rails, and baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. These contrasts help to set up contrasts within the play. It also acts as a subtle warning of the eventual ending, more notably due to the contrasts between the words womb and tomb. He also foreshadows his own role within the play at the very beginning when he says, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Because remember, one of his roles is the plan of giving this juice uh, poisonous juice portion to Juliet, which will make her appear dead. He acts as an important figure to the audience as he issues many ominous warnings. And just to repeat that quote, because it's huge, they stumble that run fast. He warns Romeo. Just to add on a little bit information about um, drugs before we move to Act 2, Scene 6. So the friar uses his knowledge of flowers and herbs to conceive Juliet's poison. We know in Act 2, Scene 3, he describes the dual qualities of flowers, medicines and poisons. The drug gives Juliet the appearance of death so that she can regain her life and her love. The friar's plan serves as the mechanism of hope for Juliet. But due to the influence of fate, becomes the vehicle of the tragedy. The friar's plan to fake Juliet's death using a sleeping drug would have been accepted by Shakespeare's audience because medical knowledge was extremely limited in the 16th century. Up to the mid-19th century, physicians often were unable to distinguish between deep comas and death. So that is where his plan he feels his plan will work. I'm going to move to Act 2, Scene 6 now. In this scene, Romeo and the friar wait for Juliet. And again, the friar warns Romeo about the hastiness of his decision to get married. Quote, These violent delights have violent ends and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss consume. For short quotations, look, you've got violent ends. The friar's words are a forewarning because he draws parallels between the destructive passion of Romeo and Juliet and the feud that will cause the deaths of Romeo, Juliet, Mercutio, Tybalt and Paris. The use of the iambic pentameter here shows the power of the friar's words and once again, he's right. And Juliet arrives in Act 2, Scene 6, and the friar takes them to be married. Another instance of the friar warning Romeo is there. Therefore, love moderately, long love doth, long love doth so, too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. So, so far, the friar has warned Romeo three times about acting quickly and not contemplating his actions three different times. So, actually, the friar, from an audience member's point of view, is wise because we know from the prologue that they're going to die. And it's almost like the friar is warning Romeo of... What could potentially happen? But unfortunately, 
Romeo just doesn't hear him, does he? They fall love moderately. Too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. We then arrive at Act 3, Scene 3, and we're in Friar Lawrence's cell. And Romeo is overcome with grief, because remember, Mercutio has died now, and Romeo has killed Tybalt. Now, Romeo is overcome with grief, and he wonders what his punishment will be by the prince. And Friar Lawrence tells him that he's really lucky, because actually, the prince has only banished him. Lady Capulet wanted him dead, didn't she? Romeo claims, though, that banishment is a penalty far worse than death, since he has to live without Juliet. So, the friar tries to counsel Romeo, but he's so unha unhappy he won't listen, and he falls to the floor in a kind of fit. And the nurse arrives. Romeo asks for, Ju for news of Juliet. How is she? And he assumes that Juliet will think he's a murderer. And in this moment, he threatens to stab himself and the friar stops him. I'm going to go into more detail with quotations in a second. He explains that Romeo has a lot to be grateful for. He and Juliet are both alive. And after everything has calmed down, the prince might change his mind. So the friar comes up with the plan that Romeo will visit Juliet that night, but he has to leave the chamber in the morning and leave Verona and he's got to wait in Mantua until there's a moment for the news of Romeo and Juliet's marriage to be spread okay in terms of key quotations the friar says a gentler judgment vanished from his lips not body's death but body's banishment so look a gentler judgment not body's death but body's banishment so that is when he explains that Romeo you're not you know you're not going to be punished with death rather banishment and then underneath they have just added another one the left is what the friar says and the right is a translation hence from Ver Verona art thou banished so again for quick quotations art thou banished and then he tells Romeo again it's you know it's it's so repetitive, really, that Romeo isn't listening. Be patient, okay? He tells him, don't do anything silly. Don't do anything foolish. Be patient. Massive quotation. Again, obviously, Romeo isn't going to listen, is he? So he, he warns him. And your translation there, from now on, you are banished from Verona. You should be able to endure this because the world is broad and wide. And the, the friar kind of almost loses his temper with Romeo because, as I said, Romeo's acting like a child here and he throws himself to the floor in a fit. And the friar, like, says, Oh, deadly sin, oh, rude unthankfulness, thy fault our law calls death, but the kind prince, taking thy part, hath rushed aside the law and turned that black word death to banishment. This is dear mercy, and thou sees it not. So the friar explains to Romeo he, th that the prince has been nice. He's letting him live. That black word death to banishment. Now the friar makes a dramatic contribution here by telling the audience in his soliloquy that there is inevitability about Romeo's actions because he says thou art wedded to calamity, i.e., you're married to something that is going to go wrong. The friar stops Romeo committing suicide when he says, hold thy desperate hand. However, he also hints at the upcoming downfall, and this is a massive quote. Wilt thou slay thyself and slay thy lady that in thy life lives by doing damned and hate upon thyself. Look at that quotation. It is a reference to Romeo and Juliet's eventual suicide. When we are talking about the role of the friar, not only does he assist in the deaths of the lovers, he acts as a massive tool of foreshadowing. So try and remember those quotations. Thou art wedded to calamity. When he stops him committing suicide the first time, hold thy desperate hand, and then wilt thou slay thyself and slay thy lady? 
look at that because as we know, it's exactly what's going to happen. So as I say, the friar acts as a means of foreshadowing. He goes even further in his advice because remember, he does act as someone that Romeo and Juliet look to for advice. And again, the blue is what he says and the white is a translation. And he says to Romeo, Juliet is alive. For whose dear sake thou wast but lately dead, they art thou happy. Tybalt would kill thee, but thou slewest Tybalt. They art thou happy. The law that threatened death becomes thy friend and turns it to exile. They art thou happy. Look at that repetition. A pack of blessings light upon thy back. Happiness caught thee in her best array. So when Romeo's being stupid and trying to kill himself, the friar provides advice. And he's right. He said, you know what, Julia is alive. You could be dead. Tybalt could have killed you, but you killed him. It's a blessing that you're alive and, and the punishment is exile. And your translation is straightforward there, really. Your Juliet is alive. It was for her that you were almost killed earlier. Be happy that she's alive. Tybalt wanted to kill you, but you killed Tybalt. Be happy that you're alive. That's almost very ominous in itself, isn't it? Be happy that you're alive. Be happy that you're alive. Yeah, thou art happy. It's ominous because Romeo isn't taking heed of the advice he's given and then, as I say, the friar does say, your life is full of blessings. We get to Act 4, Scene 1, and this involves Paris trying to marry Juliet. So, Paris tells Friar of his proposed marriage to Juliet. The friar expresses concern that the wedding has been arranged too quickly, and he offers various reasons to delay the ceremony. Again, dramatic irony here as an audience member, we know she's married to Romeo. Juliet arrives at the friar's cell and manages to cleverly sidestep Paris's compliments and references to the marriage. Paris leaves, and this is when Juliet begs the friar for a solution to her tragic dilemma, because she fears that death is her only option. And so the friar offers Juliet a remedy, the sleeping potion that she is to take the night before her wedding. And the idea is that the potion will make her unconscious, so she appears dead. I, meant, I talked about drugs earlier on in the video. In the meantime, the friar is supposed to let Romeo know of this plan. So Juliet agrees and leaves with the potion. In more detail, in this scene, Juliet threatens to kill herself and the friar interrupts her. Now that's almost a parallel to what's just happened when Romeo tried to kill himself and the friar stopped him. And he says, Corpse with death himself to escape from it, I'll give thee remedy. Look at that quote, short, easy to remember. I'll give thee remedy. This shows us the intentions of the friar and that he has a plan. But it also shows us that the friar is facing the inevitable fate, that the lovers are going to die. So by attempting to help the lovers, he's playing out fate because he's assisting it. And he says, shall Romeo by my letters know our drift? And again, famous last words, if you like, because Romeo never gets the letter. He doesn't find out. So the friar is m massive in Act 3, Scene 3 and Act 4, Scene 1 because he stops the pair of them killing themselves and creates this plan which fails. We've got to start asking ourselves how far the friar is responsible for the event. If we look again there on the left is what he says and the right is your translation... And this is his willingness to help Juliet. But it's also concern of his own actions because he married them, didn't he? So he tries to prevent being a part of the bigger mismarriage of Juliet and Paris. Again, huge quote. I don't expect anyone to remember it, but we look at it and see what we can take from it. So he says to Juliet, hold daughter, I do spy a kind of hope 
which craves as desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. If rather than to marry County Paris, thou hast the strength of will to slay thyself. So straight away, we found something we can use. Slay thyself. Then it is likely thou wilt undertake a thing like death to chide away the shame that copest with death himself to escape from it. I already gave you that quote. And if thou darest, I'll give thee remedy. So there's two short quotations that we can use from the friar's advice to Juliet. Slay thyself, I'll give thee remedy. And your translation, hold on daughter, I see some hope. But we must act boldly because the situation is so desperate. If you've made up your mind to kill yourself instead of marrying Count Paris, then you'll probably be willing to try something like death to solve this shameful problem. You can wrestle with death to escape from shame and if you dare to do it, I'll give you the solution. Again, ominous words from the friar when he says that the situation is so desperate because you would think he would be wise enough to think, oh, things are getting out of hand here and faking Juliet's death seems silly but he doesn't remember and therein lies the friar's naivety of trying to help the lovers So just to reiterate those lines, shall Romeo by my letters know our drift and hither shall come and he and I shall watch thy waking and that very night shall Romeo bear thee to Mantua. So it's unforeseen to the friar and Juliet is that Romeo doesn't receive the letter. So the friar once again plays a key role in the deaths. He is the catalyst and an accomplice. He has so far married the lovers in secret, given Juliet the sleep and portion, and now he fails to deliver the letter to Romeo. So there's three huge moments in the play, which is why, I keep telling you, he is arguably a catalyst. In Act 5, Scene 2, the friar's role within the play is finalised, as he hears that Romeo has not received the letter. This allows the audience to see the friar's contribution to the deaths in full. And at the end, he flees the tomb because he can't save Juliet. And his failure to inform Romeo about the sleep in Juliet has resulted in the suicides. Your quotation on the left, translation on the right. I hear some noise. Lady, come from that nest of death. Contagion and unnatural sleep, a greater power than we can contradict, hath thwarted our intents. Come, come away, thy husband is in thy bosom, there lies dead, and Paris too. Come, I'll dispose of thee among a sisterhood of holy nuns. Stay not to question, for the watch is coming. Come, go, good Juliet, I dare no longer stay. So, he says to Juliet, come out of the tomb, a greater power has ruined the plan, Therein lies a reference to fate when he says a greater power than we can contradict has thwarted our intent, okay? Your husband lies dead. Come on, I'll place you among a sisterhood of nuns. Don't wait to ask questions. We need to leave, basically. Now, that it appears here that the friar is quite panicked that Romeo has died and his letter didn't reach him, so he feels some responsibility. And his new idea, if you like, is for Juliet to join the Sisterhood of Nuns, which clearly the audience know is not going to be the conclusion of the play. So the friar, as I say, panics here. He doesn't want to stay in the tomb where Romeo's dead and he begs Juliet to leave the tomb as well. Overall, Friar Lawrence is a friar who plays the part of a wise advisor to Romeo and Juliet, 
along with aiding in major plot developments. Alone, he foreshadows the tragic events of the play with his soliloquy about plants and their similarity, similarities to humans. When Romeo requests the friar marry him to Juliet, he is shocked because only days before, Romeo had been infatuated with Rosaline, a woman who did not return his love. Friar Lawrence decides to marry Romeo and Juliet in the attempt to stop the civil feud. When Romeo is banished for killing Tybalt and flees to Mantua, Friar Lawrence tries to help the two lovers get back together using a potion to fake Juliet's death. The friar sends a letter to Romeo explaining the situation, but it does not reach him. Romeo kills Paris, whom he finds weeping near Juliet's corpse, and then commits suicide by drinking poison. Friar Lawrence arrives just as Juliet awakes. He urges Juliet not to be rash and to join a society of nuns, but he hears a noise from outside and then flees from the tomb. Juliet kills herself with Romeo's dagger, completing the tragedy. The friar is forced to return to the tomb, where he recounts the entire story to Prince and all the Montagues and Capulets. As he finishes, the prince proclaims, We have still known thee for a holy man. Although he does not spend a lot of time on stage, he is pivotal to the plot. He demonstrates that he is well-intentioned but short-sighted. The risks he takes to help others lead to tragedy. He does not consider the repercussions of some of his actions, for example, marrying Romeo and Juliet. His inclination to use his heart instead of his intellect costs Romeo and Juliet their lives. We could argue he is also a classic tragic hero to some extent, and no, he doesn't die. He is well-intentioned, he possesses a great ability, but he has a fatal flaw. And it's what I mentioned earlier, he is short-sighted and naive. And the audience is left wondering what would happen if he did not assist and devise the plans. So, he makes a large contribution to the dramatic events within the play, from his agreement to marry Romeo and Juliet in private which is a key error leading to their downfall. His failure to control Romeo's reckless behaviour and to inform him of the plan leads directly to Romeo's suicide. And the consequence of this event, coupled with him fleeing the scene, enables Juliet to take her life as well. However, throughout the play can also be assumed that fate was the controlling factor throughout and that Friar Lawrence's role was not simply to cause the events but to hint to the audience all along that the events could not be stopped. With this in mind, all along he contrasts language. The language he uses shows the difficulty in changing events and stopping fate. For example, the instances of foreshadowing. The fact that he is a man of God also shows that God's will was inevitable in order to stop the feuding of the Capulets and Montagues, and in order for a new life to begin, it cost Romeo and Juliet their lives, and their lives were unvo unavoidable which is outlined by star-crossed lovers in the prologue. I hope this video has been useful. If you need any more of my videos, just type my name into YouTube. It's Stacey Ray, S-T-A-C-E-Y, and Ray is R-A-A-Y, and good luck in your English literature exam.